Judy and I work with the Natural Science Collections here at Manchester Museum. The dodo was first discovered by European settlers in Mauritius in 1598, but by 1680 this flightless bird was extinct. This means we have no real stuffed specimens and no way of knowing what it actually looked like, except from historical descriptions and paintings. The most common image of the dodo is that of a rather fat bird, and from this reconstructions like this mount have been made using chicken feathers. The fragmentary remains of dodo skeletons, like these bones at Manchester Museum, have been used by scientists to estimate the size of the skeleton and how much weight the bird could carry. Measurements suggest that the skeleton would not have supported such a fat bird. As a flightless bird, it didn't need large muscles in its chest to fly, so it would have been far less pronounced than shown here. Until recently, dodo bones had only been found in the marshy coastal areas of Mauritius, but excavations have yielded new finds in the Highland Caves which show that they're more widely distributed than first thought. The Baiji was one of the world's few true river dolphin species. It had very highly developed sonar and very reduced vision because the Yangtze is very murky and full of sediments. The word Baiji means white dolphin in Chinese, so it's very pale in colour. In my opinion, it was the most beautiful of the different river dolphin species. The first dolphin surveys in China were conducted in the late 70s and early 80s, and by this stage already the population had fallen to only around 400 animals. By the end of the 20th century, there were possibly only 13 wild dolphins left in the Yangtze. The EDGE programme was established in order to conserve species which are highly threatened but which also have very few close relatives. They're one of a kind, so if they die out there'll be nothing like them left on Earth. The Baiji was the only member of an entire mammal family. It diverged from all other whales and dolphins over 20 million years ago. We surveyed the river using two different survey vessels, visual surveying using binoculars and big eye telescopes, and also by acoustic surveying, towing a hydrophone behind one of the boats. So we'd not only be looking for dolphins, but also listening out for their distinctive clicks and whistles. Witnessing the extinction of a unique species such as the Yanks River Dolphin is a really devastating experience to go through. For the international conservation community, it really needs to act as a wake-up call that we need to be far more efficient and far more quick to react to conservation crises in the future. This fertile wooded valley is a land of giants. In it, one creature rules above all others, a highly evolved killer. For a million years, this top predator has lived unchallenged. It is Smilodon fatalis, the saber tooth. But this formidable animal, with no predator to fear and plentiful game to eat, is about to disappear forever.
11,000 years later, a city of freeways and skyscrapers has arisen from the valley. Yet it has not totally obliterated all traces of the saber tooth. Evidence still remains beneath downtown Los Angeles. The Rancho La Brea Tar Pits is one of the world's most extraordinary fossil sites. These pools of tar contain a record of life stretching back into the Ice Age. Paleontologists have unearthed millions of fossilized bones. For Blair van Volkenberg, it's a gold mine. Believe it or not, this um, black swamp that I'm standing in the middle of is a paleontologist's dream. I mean, it is hard to believe looking at it, but it is chock-a-block with bone. I mean, from all the tar pits that are in this small area, um, there are over four million specimens that have been found, things as small as rodents and as large as mammoths. This paleontologist's dream is the result of an accident of ancient geology. Tar seeps from under the earth through cracks caused by California's frequent earthquakes. Pools of deadly oil form just below the surface. 10,000 years ago, you're a thirsty animal, and you might walk out, approach that water, and because you're a rather large and heavy animal, that you'd find your feet sinking, and you would struggle, but that would actually probably drive you deeper as you struggle, and pretty soon you'd be in a position from which you were no longer able to get yourself out of. It would have been a slow, agonizing death. And even today, we see things getting stuck. It's not that this process stopped 10,000 years ago. It's still happening. You can see the tar coming up on the surface. And over here, you can see a little yellow rumped warbler that probably innocently saw some water or saw a bug on the surface and swooped down to get it and never took off again. Tar is one of nature's great preservatives. So even the smallest of bones remain. Paleontologists can reconstruct the past using the bones of the animals that they find, especially when they're beautifully preserved as they are at Rancho La Brea. You can reconstruct the strength of the animal, you can reconstruct the size of the animal, you can reconstruct its feeding habits from its teeth. The preservation at La Brea allows us to reconstruct the entire fauna with relative ease. But Rancho La Brea is famous for reconstructing one creature above all others, the saber tooth. Over 2,000 of them have been recovered. Now we can probably guess that this might be a female. It's hard to tell because female and male saber tooths were about the same size. So we need to really do a lot of detailed measurements to actually figure that out. And it really illustrates how well the tar preserves these fossils. There's just no distortion. The cat is very beautifully preserved and it's very easy for us to think about them moving around the landscape here, recreating, at least for a paleontologist, it's easy to recreate them in our own mind and see them roaming the plains of Los Angeles some 11,000 years ago. This female saber tooth is nine years old. She's very similar to a male cat up to a metre high at the shoulder, and the weight of four men. She's tracking her prey, searching for the scent left by large game, like bison or horses. The saber-tooth is often thought of simply as a lion with big teeth, but it's a very different animal. She's twice as heavy as a modern lion, built more like a bear with stocky muscular shoulders, shortened hind legs and a stunted tail, all designed to deliver power to her killer canines. So why did the saber tooth evolve its bizarre body and even stranger teeth? And is there a link between them and the animal's extinction. 
obviously one of the most remarkable things about saber-toothed cats are these saber-like canine teeth that they have. And these are the longest canine teeth of any carnivore that ever existed, at least for the size of the cat. They're definitely the longest. And they're very sharp, actually, on the back edge. And they're narrow from side to side and knife-like in cross-section. Clearly, the teeth were vicious weapons, but little is understood about how the saber tooth used them to kill. To find out means looking at the muscular structure of the entire body. But there's a problem. The tar pits preserve bone, not muscle. So one paleontologist has turned to modern cats to investigate this. The nearest match isn't a speedy runner like a cheetah, but the slower moving jaguar. This zoo animal died of natural causes. Now it's helping Virginia Naples to find out how its ancient saber-toothed relative actually behaved as a predator. The biggest mystery about saber-toothed cats is how an animal with very long and very sharp but very thin and brittle teeth could have been able to make a bite without these teeth being broken. And how were they able to use their muscles in order to generate enough force to make the bite. Understanding how the jaguar's biting muscles attach to the skull allows Virginia to compare the awesome power of the saber-tooth's bite. The saber-tooth cat skull, in addition to being larger than the jaguar skull, is different in shape and you've got much greater space here for this muscle than you do in this animal. So we can assume this muscle was bigger and therefore could exert more force than the corresponding muscle in the jaguar, which would help to give this animal a stronger bite. The skull also reveals the mouth could have opened some 30 degrees wider than the jaguar and other modern cats to administer the killing bite. The shape of the skull and the heavy body both show the creature had evolved to ambush lone animals. We've got an animal here with very heavy limbs, short legs, it would not have been a sprinter. It would have had to hide in ambush and sneak up on its prey. This animal was much bigger, relatively speaking much heavier, with even heavier muscles. If this animal could not run particularly fast, this animal would have been even more dependent upon hiding from its prey and then pouncing on it at the last minute. A lone bison has moved into the female's hunting ground in search of fresh grazing. Without the protection of a herd, it's exposed to a terrible risk. The female saber-tooth is hungry, and she has two new cubs to feed. Her massive bulk means she can eat around 30 kilograms of meat in one go. As a slow runner, good cover is vital to the success of her ambush. If she can pounce, she's capable of severing a bison's jugular and crushing its windpipe with a single bite. Yet even for a predator as deadly as the saber-tooth, ambush hunting is a high-risk strategy. She's paid a price for her kill, injuring her back while wrestling the two-ton bison to the ground. Proof that hunting could take a heavy toll on saber-tooths comes from the bones found at La Brea. Paleopathologist Chris Shaw finds hundreds of similar injuries on saber-tooth bones many of which he thinks were caused by bringing down large prey. Being a large, vicious carnivore is an awfully risky business, no matter where you are in the world. We have this very nice example of a pelvis of a saber-toothed cat. This side is normally developed, looks and shape is very normal. On the other side, however, we have a very traumatic injury. What happened here was that the thigh bone itself had dislocated from the joint and there was complete 
destruction of cartilage, which affected uh, this area by bacteria getting in here and causing a massive infection. Over 5,000 mangled saber-tooth bones have been found at La Brea. For Chris, they are not only evidence of the high-risk hunting strategy saber-tooths pursued, but how group behavior may have evolved to help injured animals. The incredible thing is that these crippling injuries did not kill these animals. What killed these animals was the La Brea tar pits getting entrapped in the La Brea tar pits. To me, these injuries indicate that these animals were social animals. And being part of a social group affords these really uh, seriously injured individuals the opportunity to feed at group kills and also to be protected by the rest of the group. Several hours have passed since the kill, and the injured female has eaten her fill. She's joined by her cubs. While they eat, she nurses her wounds. A male comes along. He's her two-year-old son. She tolerates his presence. In fact, this social behavior helps defend the kill from scavengers. Until they've all eaten their fill. The saber tooth thrived as long as there was prey and adequate cover from which to attack it. But while life seems abundant, this saber tooth family are already facing a threat that will prove decisive. Around them, their valley home is changing, and their reign as the top predator is about to end forever. Having reigned as top predator for a million years, this saber tooth, along with the rest of her species, is suddenly facing extinction. The fossil record at the La Brea tar pits reveals that a catastrophe overwhelmed many species. Not just the saber tooth, but many other animals disappeared too. About 11,000 years ago, something strange happened, and we find no more of these saber tooths anymore in this tar pit or anywhere else in North America. And along, lost alongside them are the dire wolves and the mastodons, the mammoths, the camels, the horses, all the things they preyed upon. In fact, this saber tooth is probably one of the last saber tooth cats that existed in North America. In this land of giants, many of the largest animals, like the mammoth, died out. Dating their remains shows this coincided exactly with the end of the last ice age. For a hundred thousand years, global temperatures had been around 10 degrees Celsius colder than today. But by 11,000 years ago, the climate was warming up. In Arizona's Sonoran Desert, paleobotanist Julio Betancourt has discovered compelling evidence revealing what conditions were like when the saber tooth ruled and the drastic change that was about to overwhelm it. Today the Sonoran Desert is very dry, but Julio's discovery reveals that it wasn't always like this. And evidence for this comes from an unlikely animal, the pack rat. This seemingly unremarkable rodent reveals a major environmental change was unfolding at the same time as the saber tooth disappeared. All because of how its ancestors built their nests 12,000 years ago. Well, here's what all the excitement is about. This is actually a pack rat nest right here that was occupied by a pack rat in this particular case uh, about 12,000 years ago. Pack rats use these rock shelters for cover and they bring in a lot of plant material from about 50 meters, 60 meters away. The plants the pack rat built its nest from have been preserved in a unique way. The pack rat oftentimes pees all over these uh, piles of, of plant remains, and as the urine evaporates, um, it crystallizes and holds all of this material together like amber. But most significantly, the preserved plant remains confirm forests grew here during the Ice Age when it was colder and wetter. 
the beauty of it is is the that the preservation is actually exquisite we see here for example that there are the needles or the leaves of a of a pine we also have uh, junipers and oaks so we know that there were pine juniper and oak woodlands covering most of the Sonoran Desert at the end of the last ice age before uh, big herbivores and things like saber-toothed tigers became extinct. But the pack rat evidence from a thousand years later tells a very different story. The pine and oak forests were disappearing. The ice age was coming to an end, heralding massive environmental changes that continue till this day. So the overall trend for the southwestern United States and Southern California um, since the last ice age has been towards hotter, drier environments and towards more desert vegetation. But how could changing vegetation be linked to the extinction of a carnivore like the saber tooth? While the change didn't affect the female and her cubs directly, it did affect their food supply in vital ways. Ironically, paleoecologist Greg MacDonald believes it actually increased it. The biggest mystery that we have to look at is the fact that not everything goes extinct, but you have animals that do survive. Here in North America, you have mammoths, mastodons, horses, uh, they all disappear. And yet other groups of animals, like the North American antelope, the American bison, uh, a lot of those animals did survive and did quite well, increased in numbers and, and spread out. Horses didn't return until Spanish conquistadors reintroduced them a mere 500 years ago. Scientists must explain their extinction and also why the bison survived and thrived. To solve this puzzle, Greg must investigate how different animals cope with the changing vegetation. This is not a job for the squeamish. Talking about why some animals became extinct and other ones survived, one of the clues that we can look at is actually in their dung. If we tear apart the uh, droppings of a buffalo and look at the plant fibers inside, we can see that they're very fine, and that's because they chew their food twice. If we look at horses, animals with a simple stomach, you can see that the plant material is much coarser. What this means is, is that buffalo, the ruminants, get a lot more nutrition out of the plant material than what the simple stomached animals like the horse can do. As the variety and nutritional value of plant life changed, it now seems the ruminants had an inbuilt evolutionary advantage. The variety of plants that's living in an area is changing. And this probably creates a, a crisis. And those animals that are better at getting the nutrients out survive, like the bison, whereas those that are not as good are going extinct, like the horse. But for the saber-tooth, the proliferation of bison means hard times. Despite the fact she's beautifully designed as an ambush predator, she's becoming peculiarly vulnerable. In drier, more open country, there's less cover, and she'll struggle to hunt using her highly evolved ambush skills. She'll need to chase down her prey, but she simply isn't built for speed. Bison farmer Larry Toller appreciates how hard it is to hunt bison. To kill a bison is damned hard. They don't like to separate from each other. They stay very, as a very close, tight-knit group. They protect the babies. To get one separated is almost impossible because the herd doesn't want it to happen. The ability to hunt successfully, always a tricky business, was now even more difficult. Not only was there less cover to ambush from, Fossil discoveries show Greg McDonald that the bison were evolving a powerful new defense mechanism. One of the things that we see happens is they become smaller. This does have advantages though because a smaller animal does not require as much food for survival and you can pack more animals into a given area, which means you can have larger herds, which has the advantage of more eyes, more animals on the watch out for predators. The growth of large bison herds was another terrible blow to the saber-toothed's chances of survival. 
As the Ice Age ended, solitary prey is hard to find. Many prey species have disappeared. Others, like bison, have safety in numbers. So while there's plenty of meat on the hoof, catching it is very hard for an ambush predator. Despite being beautifully designed to pounce and kill, now everything is working against her. In bigger groups, the bison spot danger more easily across the open land. They've seen her coming and can easily outrun her. Superb adaptation to an Ice Age environment didn't help the female saber-tooth once that environment changed. In a different world, the predator at the top of the food chain is even more vulnerable to annihilation. Starving, the female saber-tooth has had to abandon her cubs. She'll never reproduce again. Forced to survive on carrion, the smell of rotting flesh lures her to the deadly tar pit. Hunger overpowers her sense of caution and drives her to the edge of the black abyss. largest known carnivorous marsupial of modern times. Also known as the Tasmanian tiger, it gets its name because of its striped back and was native to continental Australia, Tasmania and New Guinea. Although a team of investigators have recently claimed to have found evidence of the animal's presence in remote parts of Tasmania's northwest, it has been thought of as extinct for about 80 years. The last known thylacine to be killed in the wild was shot in 1930 by Wilfred Batty, a Tasmanian farmer. But the last ever known thylacine was apparently named Benjamin. Captured in 1933 by Elias Churchill and sent to Hobart Zoo where it lived for three years. Benjamin died on the 7th of September 1936 and it is believed that it died as a result of neglect. It was apparently locked out of its sheltered sleeping quarters and exposed to extreme heat during the day and freezing temperatures at night. The wild Tasmanian tigers survived in Tasmania up until the 1930s but was extinct from Australia and New Guinea in the 19th century. The animal was thought to have become extinct as a result of the Tasmanian government setting a bounty on the head of dead adults. This was because the local farmers believed the Tasmanian tiger was attacking their livestock. The government paid out 2,184 bounties in the end but it was thought that many more Tasmanian tigers were killed and never claimed for. Also, the introduction of dogs and disease is thought to have aided in the destruction of this animal. However, Australian scientists have managed to extract a gene from a preserved specimen of a Tasmanian tiger and make it active. They removed the equivalent gene from a mouse embryo, implanted the tiger gene and then watched as the mouse continued to grow normally, suggesting the tiger gene had been activated. This means that the extinct striped-backed creature could be brought back to life, becoming de-extinct. But should we revive this creature? Some say that we should to right the wrongs that we have caused by making the animal extinct in the first place. Others say that we don't have any idea of how to reintroduce the animal into a natural ecosystem and that there are plenty of living species that are critically endangered, needing our help already. Species revival could mean that we can bring back many long extinct animals from the woolly mammoth to the dodo bird. But should science commit to such a monumental task? Should we as the human race play God? The Revive and Restore initiative in the United States aims to resurrect the North American passenger pigeon, which became extinct in 1914. They claim that it is not playing God to bring extinct animals back, and that the question is whether we were playing God when we caused the extinction of some species in the first place. So do you think that scientists should de-extinct certain species? 
Could you imagine living in a world where you could go and see a woolly mammoth in the wild? Is science just mending wrongs that we as human beings have caused in the past? Well, who knows? But this idea is no longer a fantasy. So what do you think? I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to check out... This is a quaha, a subspecies of the plain zebra extinct for more than 100 years. It was mounted and studied by naturalist Reinhard Rao at the South African Museum in Cape Town. George Asal with the museum and project knew Rao. The one that started um, the Quagha project is uh, my former colleague and mentor, uh, Mr. Reinhold Rao, who passed away two years ago. When he remounted the, uh, the Cape Quagha, he found tissue, which he then collected, and he sent it to two groups of American scientists who did DNA testing. And they found that the quagga is actually a subspecies of the plains zebra. Therefore, the main gene pool still exists within the plains zebra. Unlike zebras that still roam parts of South Africa, the quagga had vivid stripes on the front of the body only. The last one died in 1883 at an Amsterdam zoo. Quaha project coordinator Craig Lardner says the effort to bring back the species was begun by Rao in 1979. He then started a selective breeding program of a, a, a quaha, a plain zebra, trying to breed out the, the continual striping, trying to breed back into the animal, the, um, or should I rather use the word revival rather than breeding back, because understand is you cannot bring something back from extinction, but you can revive a subspecies. Lardner agrees with zoologist Peter Lloyd, who says species loss is irreversible. It would be very unfair to say you have recreated the quagga. And there's also a danger, uh, and the danger is that you could create the wrong impression to people and say that once an animal is extinct, don't worry, we can always recreate it. This is a special set of circumstances. There are several subspecies. They're using one of the subspecies and its lack of striping in certain individuals to try and produce an animal that looks similar in external appearance to the, the quagga. Visitors at Cape Town's South African Museum are enthusiastic about the project. In this museum they just see the quagga as a, as a, as a, a model, as a statue, but to see it alive, I mean, it's uh, quite an experience. As God created those animals, it's, it's up to us as human beings to accept them and to appreciate what God has created for us. So I think it's good that the scientists are recreating this animal. I think it's very good. Project scientists say that while they have been able to breed animals appearing similar to the extinct species, humankind must know that once extinct, a species is lost forever. All Cisco, VOA News. After a hundred thousand years, the Ice Age is coming to an end. This treeless grassland is the domain of a spectacular creature. A creature which ranged across Europe from the French Pyrenees to the Russian steppes, but in Ireland it found a homeland which human hunters had not reached. It has antlers so vast and elaborate, they stretch 12 feet from tip to tip. They are the crowning glory of the magnificent Irish elk. But this giant deer has presented science with an intractable mystery. Why, having flourished for millennia, did it undergo catastrophic extinction? Were its massive antlers to blame? The Irish elk has a sort of iconic status among Irish biologists. And it seems to me that it's a great animal to study the great themes of evolution. For example, how did it get to be as it is? And in this particular case, how did it die? 
A disused army barracks in the heart of Dublin is the final resting place for prehistoric remains which have been excavated over the last 200 years. Paleontologist Tom Hayden has come to take a closer look. Stored here are the peat blackened remains of hundreds of Irish elk, which died between 10 and 15,000 years ago. The stag skulls are extraordinary, boasting the largest antlers of any deer that has ever existed. This is what all the fuss has been about, a male Irish elk. This animal had antlers which weighed about 40 kilos and measured in large specimens 12 feet from end to end. I could stretch myself along the antlers from one tip to the other twice. No modern animal comes close. To find out how it coped with such a massive burden, Tom needs to examine a fully assembled skeleton. It's clear that the Irish elk had specialized, evolving a physique capable of supporting its vast antlers. There's a massive rib cage. And this, in life, of course, supported a very large heart and very large lungs. And this is what we would expect for an animal that had a lifestyle like the giant deer. Uh, an open plains runner, uh, probably high stamina, and this essentially is typical of an aerobic machine. And now we come to the more spectacular end of the animal, where we find the antlers. And quite apart from being extremely heavy, they're also extremely awkward, because a lot of the weight is a long way away from the center of the animal's body. So it's like holding very large buckets at arm's length and trying to maneuver them. It puts a lot of torsion and stresses on its neck. And for that reason, the vertebrae in its neck are very large, quite strong, to try and cope with the stresses and strains of moving this great weight about. Behind the neck, the spines and the vertebrae are very, very tall. And in life, these would have acted as anchor points for a system of cables, ligaments, which ran from here to the neck and helped the animal to raise it and move it around. Antlers place a further demand on a deer. It must shed and regrow them each year. So how did the Irish elk fuel the growth of their unusually massive antlers? What did they eat? Tom Hayden is looking for clues amongst the teeth of a mature stag skull. These white enamel ridges have very, very fine scratches. And there is only one substance we know about which will produce these scratches, and that is grass. Grass has silica particles in between the cells, which act like sandpaper as far as the teeth are concerned. And if you look at the enamel on a giant deer and compare it to the enamel on a cow, they're identical. So this is strong evidence to suggest that they ate mainly grass. Pollen samples reveal late Ice Age Ireland was an open treeless landscape. It's abundant grasslands rich in nutrients like calcium. A perfect environment for the bulk grass feeding the Irish Elks antlers require. in the 19th century, Charles Darwin's detractors seized upon these antlers to attack his heretical theory of natural selection. If the survival of the fittest really designed animals to survive, what possible advantage could such an extravagant burden provide? They used the Irish elk to cast doubt on Darwin's theory. To this day, researchers continue to question how natural selection could have produced such large antlers. Why invest so much in them? What was their purpose? Paleontologist Adrian Lister believes that today's fallow deer can provide vital clues. The bucks have got their antlers about half grown, but you can already see the way the antlers grow horizontally out from the head, just like in the Irish elk. There they go. 
monkeys conducted anatomical studies that have thrown up a surprising result. They reveal the tiny fallow deer is a distant cousin of the Irish elk. The Irish elk has got particularly strongly developed neck vertebrae, which were to hold up the very heavy head with the weight of the antlers. And the fallow deer, if we look at the neck vertebrae, have got the same structures, although of course they haven't got such heavy antlers now. They've got the similar structure and that proves the relationship. But can the fallow deer provide an insight into how Irish elk stags use their vast antlers? Sex may provide the answer. Fallow deer have a mating system called lecking, in which females move among the stags and choose their mate on the merits of his antlers. In the fallow deer, the male will do a kind of display, moving his head from side to side, and he's got these flattened palmations of the antlers which will be shown off in that way to the female who's following on behind him. With the Irish elk, with the uh, flattened parts going straight out horizontally like that and also being so large, uh, maybe the animal didn't have to do that kind of behaviour, just standing there uh, would have been impressive enough. If the female was interested enough, then mating would ensue. The huge palms of the stag's antlers flash like mirrors across the open landscape, attracting a female willing to mate. For females, the choice is simple because, for them, bigger antlers indicate a fitter male. So the genes of large antlered males were continually passed on. Sexual selection was driving the development of these enormous antlers. For over a hundred years, scientists denied the antlers could have any other role. Now biomechanics expert Andrew Kitchener can prove they were also deadly weapons. What my research has shown is that the antlers are not just designed for display. There's too much material in here to just be used as an elaborate advertisement hoarding. They're designed for fighting, both at the structural level, as to how they actually fit together, and also at the mechanical level. They are actually strong enough to take the massive forces that would have been produced in fighting. The highest density of bone occurs where the antlers impact and lock together. From his observations of other deer, Andrew has demonstrated how these points, known as tines, could be used for defense and attack. In the mating season, stags challenge each other for the right to mate. At first, the stags size each other up. But what would happen if battle commenced? The next stage would be to twist the head right round, drop it down to the ground so that the nose points back between the front legs. And now you can see the different parts of the antler coming into function for fighting. Here we have the brow tines and also the secondary tines which act in a defensive way. They protect the head and the eye from accidental injury if the antlers were to slip against each other. And on the outside, on the palms here, we have these very long offensive tines which point in towards the neck and the flank of the opponent. And during fighting, the aim is to try and wrestle your opponent off balance and hopefully knock him over so that you can use these tines to actually stab your opponent in the flank or the neck. Andrew's research reveals stag fights would have been brutal and violent. This stag has proved he is the alpha male and secured his access to the females. In attracting a mate and fighting off rivals, the antlers were the key to passing on an individual stag's genes. But could this design have also brought the Irish elk's downfall? Carbon dating of the Dublin bones reveals that ten and a half thousand years ago, it vanished from Ireland. Why, just as the Ice Age was ending and conditions improved, 
did the Irish elk face extinction. Eleven thousand years ago, the Ice Age was coming to an end. Rising global temperatures pushed back the icy tundra that had stretched across northern Europe. In Ireland, the Irish elk, a giant deer with vast antlers, had evolved to graze the rich Ice Age grassland. Irish elk were once plentiful. Over a hundred individuals have been excavated from one peat bog alone. But around 10,600 years ago, the fossil record reveals the Irish elk disappeared suddenly and completely. What caused this catastrophic decline? Geologist Pete Coxon is trying to find out. He's investigating what happened to the local climate in Ireland at the end of the Ice Age. Almost three meters below the surface, he finds soil which dates back 11,000 years to the late Ice Age, when the Irish elk was still thriving. These late Ice Age soils are rich in pollen. They show it was cooler than today, but there was abundant grassland. You see organic sediment being laid down with seeds and bits of leaf and so on. And in this core we can even pick out fragments of, of, of plant, fossils of plant. There's some cuticle there of a, of a grass or a sedge. When Pete takes a sample from slightly higher up and 400 years later, the very end of the Ice Age, there's a dramatic change. The grass pollen has been replaced by eroded rock and sand. For Pete, it's evidence of an unexpected climate change that wiped out vegetation. We see in this section this very sudden cold snap. You see sand and inorganic material in here. You get a lot of erosion, a lot of uh, movement of soil down the slope, and that's why we see these inorganic sediments. And this cold snap lasted a thousand years. Um, temperatures seven degrees colder than the present day. Suddenly, the biological productivity plummets. Ironically, as the rest of the world warmed up at the end of the Ice Age, Ireland was hit locally by severe cold. It seems to defy logic. But the sea provides an answer. As rising temperatures melted the great polar ice caps, cold water flooded into the Atlantic Ocean, cooling it by an estimated 8 degrees Celsius. Warm Gulf Stream currents flowing up from the tropics were blocked. Ireland lost its central heating and was plunged into freezing conditions. In a severe cold period, stags with smaller antlers, less of a burden, would have had a better chance of surviving. Natural selection would predict they would now be the fittest. But is there any evidence that the Irish elk evolved to become smaller? Tom Hayden has measured hundreds of antlers from this crucial period. But he can't find any indication that they were shrinking. Ironically, sexual instinct may have outweighed survival instinct. The Irish elk was caught in a dilemma in a sense. It was being forced in one direction to maintain large size and large antlers at a very expensive cost by sexual selection. And on the other hand, natural selection would have been dictating a downsizing, a smaller animal, smaller antlers, uh, a less expensive lifestyle. Unfortunately, it couldn't make that transition. In the grip of sudden climate change, it appears the Irish elk could not evolve quickly enough. Half thousand years ago, the Irish elk succumbed to extinction. 
For scientists, that's long been the end of the story. But bones stored here are adding a new twist to the case of the Irish elk. They're not from Ireland, they're from the Isle of Man, which was then connected to Britain by a land bridge. In 2000, Adrian Lister started to carbon date Irish elk remains from northern Britain. The result from the Manx skeleton was a bombshell. We've got the radiocarbon dates back from the lab, and amazingly, they show that this Irish elk skull is the latest one that we have from anywhere in the world. This specimen is only 9,200 years old. And so this specimen shows that the species did actually survive for nearly 1,500 years longer than we'd previously imagined. The question is, why? Ireland's cold spell had been severe but local. To the east of Ireland, the Isle of Man and southern Scotland were more sheltered. And Irish elk here must have been able to cling on for another 1,500 years. Yet these late dates mean that the remaining Irish elk may have encountered a new threat. At Edinburgh University, archaeologists are sifting through the debris from a human encampment. Clear evidence that late Stone Age hunters had reached southern Scotland at the same time as the remaining Irish elk were escaping the cold. Did they hunt them down? by this possibility, Adrian Lister goes to examine the Edinburgh evidence to search for signs that man-hunted the remaining Irish elk. There's a deer tooth, that's a, that's a red deer upper molar. That's a, that's a deer humerus, forearm bone. That's red deer size. That's a little bit of the uh, bottom end of a so-called cannon bone, which is the lower leg bone. Again, that's red deer. There's a clear impression here that red deer is the dominant prey animal. There are plenty of deer bones, but no sign of Irish elk at this site. No hard evidence to point the finger at man. What else could explain the animal's final extinction? Yet again, were its giant antlers implicated? 10,000 years ago, the landscape across Britain and Ireland was transformed once more. It's so dramatic, it's like a light switch clicking on. And instantly, this landscape is warm, the soils begin to form, and any plant that's close by will suddenly be able to colonise that landscape. So by this point, nine and a half thousand years ago, you find a piece of pine wood. There, you can see the nice bright red colour in, in the bark. And right at the very top of the core here, is the shell of part of a hazelnut. Grasslands gave way to forests after the Ice Age. At first, birch, pine and hazel. But by 9,200 years ago, even oak was colonizing northern Britain. Ironically, Adrian Lister believes the changing countryside may have brought further problems for the Irish elk. The kind of habitat the Irish elk liked was lots of open grassy areas where it could graze, but it wouldn't have liked the dense forests that started to grow up as the climate warmed in the present interglacial. Uh, dense forests didn't give it the variety of food, especially grass, that it liked. Also, of course, with those very huge antlers, uh, they would have been an encumbrance in the forest and, and also would have put the Irish elk under pressure as its preferred habitat shrunk and shrunk the warming climate would have sealed the animal's fate. As the ice caps melted, sea levels were rising some 30 feet every thousand years. The Irish Sea was created, and new islands like the Isle of Man appeared. 
the remaining Irish elk were split into small vulnerable groups, literally marooned. This may have had disastrous consequences for the gene pool. If they're in a situation where they can't easily exchange genes between the populations, then the, the relic populations may become inbred, and that's not uh, healthy either, especially if they're in a situation where they would need to adapt quite quickly to changing conditions. They may not have the genetic resources to do that. 9,000 years ago, the remaining pockets of Irish elk were on the brink of extinction. It had prospered for tens of thousands of years. But finally, climate change isolated the Irish elk in small populations, struggling in an increasingly forested landscape. Evolution had crafted a highly specialized animal, dependent on open grassland to nourish its extraordinary antlers. Clearly, the general design and lifestyle of the Irish elk was tremendously successful while the going was good. And they, in a sense, specialized for this high life. And then suddenly, when the climate changes, they're almost locked into this expensive lifestyle and they can't pay the bills anymore. The case of the Irish elk reveals that, faced with a changing world, too highly evolved a design can actually prove an animal's undoing. Specialized animals are usually the ones that go to the wall first. The generalists like to meet and inherit the earth. Many of the mounted specimens have been put together with a number of bones from different specimens. Native to Madagascar, these ostrich lookalikes are believed to have come to an end in the 17th or 18th century. And it's reckoned that the elephant bird weighed around half a ton. While it's not fully known how the birds died out, it's believed that human activity is the number one suspect. Initially widespread across all areas of the island, there's evidence of their homes being demolished, while the birds themselves were hunted, which led to their untimely demise. Fossilized eggs of the species have remained and have become an increasingly priceless commodity across museums to this day. Although there were several factors threatening the birds' survival, it could have been people eating the eggs who dealt the species its final blow.